it makes it real when you think about your 10 year old mm -hmm. and the stat 318 per 100,000 for 10 to 14 are hurting themselves. And that, that's 318 girls reported at least. My mind takes me back to the Drew Robinson episode and, and I'm literally getting emotional just thinking about this because I think about how lonely, and I said this over and over, the thought that crushed me was how lonely he felt in that moment mm -hmm. that he thought the best solution here is to end it all. And I think about these 318 girls or the 640 that are older or the 400 plus boys, mm -hmm. the literal thousands of kids who are finding themselves in a place where my best option is to end it all. Mm -hmm. And how devastating that is as a parent to think about your child being that lonely. We began this book with a presentation of three great untruths, ideas so out of tune with human flourishing that they harm anyone who embraces them. In part two, we narrated a variety of campus events that have attracted national and sometimes global attention. And we showed how some students and professors involved in these events seem to have embraced the three great untruths. Now in part three, we widen the lens and look at how we got here. There is no simple answer. In part three, we, pre we present six interacting explanatory threads, rising political polarization cr and cross-party animosity, rising levels of teen anxiety and depression, changes in parenting practices, the decline of free play, the growth of campus bureaucracy, and a rising passion for justice in response to major national events, combined with changing ideas about what justice requires and in this part three tyler i wanted to cover those first five mm -hmm. that he mentioned there um, if you're just joining us if you're brand new to the podcast pause this episode now go back and listen part one and part two the book we're going through is called the coddling of the american mind it's how good intentions and bad ideas are sep setting up a generation for failure so we've kind of worked our way through different problems today we're really going to pinpoint what where do these problems where the way we the place we find ourselves in society today where did this come from why has this happened and then next week we're going to wrap up with now what do we do about it yep so again the book builds up problem 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 points out the problems why they're happening but then it finishes on a high note of okay here's what we can do about it so we're not just going to devastate you with problems yeah we're actually going to have some real world solutions of how we can turn the tide so before we jump into today's episode i did want to thank our partners today First and foremost, sleep number. And I'm not going to lie, last night was a little rough on the old sleep department. <laughs> Went to bed late. Yep. Had to, that, that 410 alarm. Got here early this morning. Usually I wake up, you know, 10, 5, 10 minutes before my alarm goes off. Today yep. my alarm actually woke me up. Yeah. And so our partners at sleep number, I'm just thinking about you how, how much imagine? worse my sleep <laughs> exactly. would have been had exactly. I not had a sleep number 360 yeah. smart. Mode. I would not have been prepared for that wrestling match that I had at, at 415 <laughs> to get out of bed or to sleep through my workout. That mental wrestling match. Oh you're my gosh, yeah. dude. I was yeah. I literally, I mean, I probably burned another 200 calories just, just in my bed sweating. Like, no, 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 get up. No, no, no. You That's need to right. sleep. No, no, no. Yeah. But I mean, luckily, luckily, so my actual, and I, and I use the sleep number app and I also have a whoop. And so I'll, I'll use both. Right. And both of them, t both of them show, yes, like I'm tired. It was hard it really. But when I was asleep, when I was there, it really was effective. Now my diet yesterday, not awesome. That directly leads into bad recovery, but sleep number because of the type of bed, because of the smart bed, it literally has adjusted to me and I was tossing and turning last night, but because of the smart bed, it was adjusting as mm -hmm. I was moving and I, it kept me in a good place of sleep. Yeah. Most of the night. Yeah. It's a catch 22. I, I'd mentioned yesterday episode, I was out at the lake all weekend. So I was away from my sleep number, yep. had bad sleep. Yep. And the last night I finally get to my sleep number and comfortable sleep. So it's yep. a catch 22 of it. It, 
keeps you in the bed yeah. <laughs> and wanting to sleep more, yeah. but it also refreshes you in a way that when yeah. you do make that mental shift of, all right, it's time to get up, get up, you're ready to jump out of bed. And it takes two minutes and you're like, okay, there we go. And my, like my whoop recovery score was terrible. Was it? Terrible. Yeah. But I felt, I felt energized enough when I got up, I was like, all right, cool. Let's go. Let's yeah. go get this. Yeah. So if you want to experience what we're talking about, get yourself to a sleep number store or to sleepnumber.com and check out their Sleep Number 360 smart beds. If you're not sleeping, a great place to yeah. find yourself, especially as the summer hits here, yeah. is Choctaw Casino and Resort. As Tyler likes to say, short drive up 75. That's right. If you're local here in DFW, it's just a quick drive, yep. 45 minutes to an hour, not that far at all. Your friend, you mentioned yesterday, your friend had never yeah. been up there before, never. went to for a little Hadn't staycation. Hadn't been up in a while. It'd Hadn't been, been up in a while. while. Went for a staycation, had a great time yep. because it's so su it's super close. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a, it really is a great time, especially during the summer. Yeah, it's summertime. Like, let's just say like this weekend or this last weekend you went out with some dads, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys went to the lake, took the boys. One thing to think about is like, hey, you know, we give the moms a weekend away every once in a while. Father's Day's coming up. Make it a boys trip. That's Go right. out by the pool, play some games, Go to eat a nice dinner mm -hmm. at the steakhouse. That's go a see idea. a show, watch a movie, a little staycation for the boys. That's right. You know? Happy Father's Day. Come on. Up. Yeah, if you're out here, you're listening, and you're thinking about what you want to get your significant other or mm -hmm. your dad, get them, get them some, some time up there at Choctaw yeah. Casino Resort. He's guaranteed to have a great time. That's right. So, uh, anyway, this summer's going to be great, full of concerts, full of great restaurants. First full, full summer pools. with the pools being open. Yes. I mean, again, it's it's just an incredible setup, and it's first class. I mean, it literally is the luxury Vegas-style resort now right. in Durant, Oklahoma. Right. So get yourself up to Choctaw Casino and Resort. All right, back to the episode. All right, let's talk about how did we get here. Society's crazy right now. So much polarization. How in the world do we end up in this place in 2022? This book goes through six, like I said, six different explanations mm. to why we're here. We're going to cover the first five or, the, or five of them today. And the first one is rising political polarization and cross-party animosity. Does that sound familiar at all right now? Golly. <laughs> From the book. And by the, the way, this book was written in 2018, right? That's right. Uh, 2019. 19. So right before the I pandemic. Think, but every reference is, it well, was, pub it was published in 19, right. but that's like right. 18 was when it was written. So what's crazy is catch on to some of these things that have just exponentially gotten, yes. gotten worse or has been proven more since this book was actually written. Yeah. Keep, keep in mind the last two years of the pandemic and riots and things like that aren't even referenced here because this book was written, but everything applies. Mm -hmm. So from the book, he says... From the 1940s to around 1980, American politics was about as centrist and bipartisan as it has ever been. One reason is that during, the, during and prior to this period, the country faced a series of common challenges and enemies, including the Great Depression, the Axis powers during World War II, and the Soviets during co the Cold War. Given the psychology of tribalism, the loss of a common enemy after the collapse of the Soviet Union can be expected to lead to more intertribal conflict. A second major region, reason is that since the 1970s, Americans have been increasingly self-segregating into politically homogenous communities. The result is that today, differences in party affiliation go hand in glove with differences in worldview and the individual's sense of social and cultural identity. A third major reason is the media environment, which has changed in ways that foster division. Long gone is the time when everybody watched one of three national television networks. By the 2010s, most Americans were using social media sites like Facebook and Twitter, which make it easy to encase oneself within an echo chamber. Both the physical and electronic isolation from people who we disagree with allow the forces of confirmation bias, groupthink, and tribalism to push us further apart. Parties have come to view each other not as legitimate rivals, but as dangerous enemies. Losing ceases to be an acceptable part of the political process and instead becomes a catastrophe. Let's take a little break there. What do yeah. you think of that? What's, uh, sorry, let me read one. Sorry, yeah. a little bit more. In other words, Americans <laughs> are now motivated to leave their couches to take part in a political action, not by love for their party's candidate, but by hatred of the other party's candidate. Mm. Negative partisanship means that American politics is driven less by hope and more by the, the untruth of us versus them. Yeah. 
Yep. They must be stopped at all costs. Mm -hmm. Now proceed. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So exactly that is, it is really sad that it takes the Great Depression, World Wars, obviously the Cold War, the fear of nuclear war, 9-11, 9-11, it takes those types of events for us to recognize, oh, wait, we are on the same side. Like, why do we have to, why does it, we have to go through that for us to recognize, and, and I'm sure there's, there's a psychological answer to it, and there's a reason, but why do we have to wait for something awful for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to perish before we say, oh, maybe we should get out of our own way and stop bickering with each other over nonsense and let's start working towards the same goal because we all have the same goals. Yep. Again, I, it's, just, it's just really, really hard. It's really hard to like stomach this. And as I watch this, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm perfect and I've got this all figured out, but like I do, like, I do think about that. Like I, when the Ukraine thing started, I just, I, I looked at that and as I'm, we're talking through this Ukraine situation with our kids and we're praying for, for resolve in that, it's like, I just hope that people recognize, like even look at like Vietnam, right? And I know there was a ton of political pushback and why we were there and, and all that. And, and I get it, but like nobody in this era knows what it's like to enact a draft and have to go f serve in the military. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what it's like to lose your brother, your father in war because you're protecting, you know, our country or our allies. Like nobody knows what it's like right now. We're talking, Oh, we're, we're inflation. We're, Oh, I just have to pay more for a truck or a car. Or my house is more expensive. Like, Nobody knows what it's like to literally starve because we had an economic collapse, not just recession, collapse. Like, why does it take the absolute rock bottom for us to recognize it? Like, hey, listen, we are all in this together. We're, 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 we, yes, we don't necessarily have an enemy, but why do, why do we have to create enemies when times are good? Yeah. It's just like, I don't know. It, that's what's really, it's really hard for me in this, these times, like with the media, and I know we're gonna talk about that, but like the division politically when it's, oh, I don't have an enemy, so I'm gonna create an enemy. Yeah, we, we discussed this a few episodes back of why, you know, the, the, the actual psychological reasons. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, a couple episodes back, we talked about this discussion yeah, of why. Yeah. Uh, the other element, and it's an interesting thought, I wonder if, we did away with parties, the Democratic and Republican Party, and now all of a sudden it's a group of people that you're having to vote on based on policy, based on what they stand for, based on what they've stood for for years past. Now you don't you have the safety. You actually have to research that person? Right. Yeah. You don't have the safety net of D or R. Yeah. Now you actually have to know what this person stands for to really make your vote count. Because again, we talked about the, in the death of nuance, when things get wild and complex, our default is to simplify. Yeah. And that's what we've done in our political system. What simpler way to make politics than, oh, that's a Democrat, I'm going to vote for him. Yep. Or that's a Republican, I'm going to vote for him. I don't even care. Yeah. Or to, I'm not even going to take the time to really look into them because it's just much easier to say, Republican, all right, I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where he talks about tribalism and we don't see it as, all right, I want the country to do better here. Mm -hmm. So let's have positive or healthy disagreements with each other, all with a common goal. It's you're a Democrat. I'm a Republican. Let's fight it. Out. Now I'm going to go vote for Republicans. Look how much the Democrats have screwed up our world the last few years. Yeah. That's such lazy, basic thinking. And it's, but it really is to our tribalistic minds yeah. of this is my team. I want to be a part of my team. I want to do right for my team. So that's what I'm going to stick to. Yeah. Whereas if we did away with parties, now there's other ramifications of that, I'm sure, that I haven't thought of that people way smarter than me can think about. Mm -hmm. But on the surface, that looks like a pretty good idea, yeah. actually, to do away with this oh, division. Oh, no doubt. I mean, and I would agree with you. That's what we need to do. That's what needs to happen. And I think we've been talking. 
people have been talking about that for a while because because it is a problem. Mm -hmm. It really, really is a problem. It, it creates enemies. The problem is, is it is we are so deep into that, and there's so much money to be made by each individual party yeah. that it would be an all-out war. I don't. It make too much sense to do that. I, by it the way. would. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, it, so the question is, I mean, what does it take? Does it take? It takes people going out and voting for an independent, right? For that to be legitimized, yeah. Like to say, all right, I'm gonna vote or for an independent, not necessarily independent, but just I mean, maybe three of the people I vote for are Democrats, and three of the people I voted for just happen to be Republicans. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's not even thinking of it three and three. It's just, yeah. hey, here's six people that just I really like. I don't even know what individually, they individually, right? right? What can you control? We can control is how I vote, right? Okay, so take the R, take the D, take that away. Mm -hmm. Like vote for who you aligns with what you believe in most mm -hmm. yep. and you believe is going to fight for those things. Yep. Like, so let's, let's, cause again, like I would say I'm a Republican, like just because of my conservative type types of beliefs. But again, like, I feel like majority of the country is I do swing in the middle because like, I do have like empathy in, in a lot of areas just from life experience. But like, if you, we could take away the D and the R on the, on the ballot and you just say, okay, Hey, look, I'm voting on names and I've actually done a little bit of research before I just show up. And I'm not just voting to say that I voted to get the sticker so that like in conversations, I can actually, I can actually, mm -hmm. you know, share my opinions by opinions. I mean, I'm regurgitating what I saw on social media. <laughs> um, it's like, no, go and actually do that. But if we could eliminate like this polarizing party system that we have right now, I think that we would be a whole lot better off. But again, sure. there's, we're so deep. There's so much money tied up in it. It's yeah. Yeah. It's a big problem to overcome. Yeah. yeah. And that's why it is such a problem because it's not an easy solve. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the first reason is our political polarization. The second thing, and this, this gets heavy, just, just warning you listening, especially if you have kids, this section is, is very sobering when you listen to it and it's rising levels of teen anxiety and depression. And so he opens up the, the, the section with in the 2017 book, I Jen, Jean twinge, a social psychologist at San Diego state university gives us the most detailed picture yet of the behavior values, values and mental state of today's teenagers and college students. Twinge is an expert on how generations differ psychologically and why. She calls the generation after the millennials iGen, like iPhone, which is short for internet generation because they are the first generation to grow up with the internet in their pockets. In 2006, when iGen's oldest were turning 11, Facebook changed its membership requirement. No longer did you have to prove enrollment in college. Now any 13-year-old or any younger child willing to, ex willing to claim to be 13 could join. But Facebook and other social media platforms didn't really draw many middle schoolers until the iPhone was introduced in 2007 and was widely adopted over the next few years. It's best then to think about the entire period from 2007 to roughly 2012 as a brief span in which the social media life of the average American teen changed substantially. In short, iGen is the first generation that spent and is now spending it's formative teen years immersed in, so, in giant social and commercial experiment of social media. What could go wrong? So I thought that was an interesting place to start, to set it up. Because I grew up, I didn't have a cell phone until I was a junior in high school. Same. And I didn't have an iPhone until like 2000, now I was late to the game on an iPhone, but I didn't have an iPhone until 2010, something like that. But they came out in 2007, 2008. So by this point, I'm 21, 22. Yeah. Still a moron, still an idiot, but not a 14 year old. Yeah. That all of a sudden now has anything I want at my fingertips. And so, yes, we do a lot of time rat, rat, you know, ragging on this younger generation, how soft they are, how coddled they are. But the fact of the matter is they're experiencing something that no generation has ever experienced right. in the history of humankind. And so to think that they're just going to come out scot free and thinking exactly the way we think is ignorant that's ignorant yep so that's the start and then he gets into or yeah then he gets into two major generational changes driving the rise of safetyism 
if you remember from earlier, the culture of safetyism, trying to protect everything, right? Words of violence, things like that. It says, Twins' analysis suggests that there are two major generational changes that may be driving the rise of safetyism on campus since 2013. The first is that kids now grow up much more slowly. Activities that are commonly thought to mark the transition from childhood to adulthood are happening later. For example, having a job, driving a car, drinking alcohol, going out on a date, and having sex. Members of iGen wait longer to do these things, and then they do less of them than did members of previous generations. Instead of engaging in these activities, which usually involve interacting with other people face-to-face, -face, teens today are spending much more time alone interacting with screens. Of special importance, the combination of helicopter parenting, fears for child safety, and the allure of screens means that members of iGen spend much less time than previous generations did going out with friends while unsupervised by an adult. The bottom line is that when members of iGen arrived on campus beginning in the fall of 2013, they had accumulated less unsupervised time and fewer offline life experiences than had any previous generation. This might explain why college students are suddenly asking for more protection and adult intervention in their affairs and interpersonal conflicts. Any comments on that so far? No, I mean, we see it. We see it every day, right? Kids don't know how to handle their own conflict because they've never had to. Yeah. Yeah, as time goes on, we learn more about the Uvalde shooter. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this is where he spent most of his time, was online, yeah. the online world, communicating yeah. with people virtually as opposed to in person. He didn't have a lot of good role models at home, didn't have a lot of relationships that seemed in person. So he found his relationship online. And that obviously, now is it always gonna lead to that catastrophe of an event? No, but you can see how that could lead to that, to something like that. So the second major generational change is a rapid rise in the rate of anxiety and depression. Here's where it starts to get, starts to get heavy. Studies of mental illness have long shown that girls have higher rates of depression and anxiety than boys do. The gap between adolescent girls and boys was fairly steady in the early 2000s, but beginning around 2011, it widened as the rate for girls grew rapidly. By 2016, roughly one out of every five girls reported symptoms that met the criteria, criteria for having experienced a major depressive episode in the previous year. The rate for boys went up too, but more slowly. One out of every five. Good night. The boy's suicide rate has moved around in recent years, or recent decades, surging in the 1980s during the gigantic wave of crime and violence that receded suddenly in the 1990s. The rate of boys' suicide rate reached its highest point in 1991. While the rise since 2007 does not bring it back up to its highest level, it is still disturbingly high. The rate for girls, on the other hand, had been fairly constant all the way back to 1981 when the data set begins. And although their rate of suicide is still substantially lower than that of boys, the steady rise since 2010 brings their rate up to the highest levels recorded for girls since 1981. Mm -hmm. Compared to the early 2000s, nearly twice as many teenage girls now in their own lives. Goodness. Confirming this increase in mental illness with a different data set, a recent study looked at non-fatal self-inflicted injuries. So. This is, there's a difference between, obviously, the reason boys have higher suicide rates is because they do things typically that are more successful. Mm -hmm. When a boy decides he's going to commit suicide, mm -hmm. they do things that are, have a higher rate of success, yeah. if that makes sense. Whereas girls, it's more inflicting the pain. So that's what this segment is talking about. Confirming the increase in mental illness with a different data set, a recent study looked at non-fatal self-inflicted injuries. These are cases in which adolescents were admitted to emergency rooms because they had physically harmed themselves by doing such things as cutting themselves with a razor blade, banging their heads into walls, or drinking poison. Gosh. The research examined data from 66 U.S. hospitals going back to 2001 and were able to estimate self-harm rates for the entire country. They found that the rate for boys held steady at roughly 200 per thousand boys in the age range of 15 to 19. The rate for girls in that age range was much higher, but had also been relatively steady from 2001 to 2009 at around 420,000, at around 420 per thousand girls. Beginning in 2010, wait, wait, however, wait, so 420 per thousand per thousand girls were hurting themselves in a way that they had to be admitted to. It's almost half. It's almost half, but 
Check this out. It gets worse. Beginning in 2010, however, the, girl, the girl's rate began to rise steadily, reaching 630 per 100,000 in 2015. Per 100,000? Per 100,000, Okay, yes. I was yeah, like, not half, but yeah, per, oh, per 100,000. Like, yeah. Are we sure we need to fact check this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The rate for younger girls, ages 10 to 14, rose even more quickly. Mm. 10-year-olds. Can you, your daughter's 10. 10. The rate for teenage girls, ages 10 to 14, rose even more quickly, nearly tripling from roughly 110 per 100,000 in 2009 to 318 per 100,000 in 2015. The corresponding rate for boys in that age range was about 40 throughout the period studied. The years since 2010 have been very hard on girls. What a... (laughs) You have two daughters. Yeah. What do you think about when you hear that? I mean, I could, I, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because I think we, and, and, and I'm going to put it on dads. Um, either dads are not there or dads even that are there are not present. Um, we're not, we're, we're not building our girls up in a way that they need to be built up. Um, I mean, I, self, um, self perception in girls has got to be an all time low. Um, and it, Tiffany, uh, so Sia, my five-year-old, a um, couple weeks back, she was like looking at herself in the mirror, and she's like, "I am so beautiful." And I like look at Tiff, and I was like, "And she's I think five. as a guy, <laughs> as a guy, I think, okay, hey, check your ego." And Tiffany caught it, and she's like, "No, like she's going to be a- attacked her entire life with her appearance, with." how good she is, like, I am going to celebrate this and embrace this because I do not want to shut her down at this age because it is just about to start. And I was like, man, like, thank God for you yeah. because I wouldn't have thought about it that way. Yeah. Like, if it's the boys, like, you know, my, my biggest thing with the boys is like, hey, don't talk about it, be about it. Like, let them tell you. Right. Don't, don't, like, have, you know, like, you go earn it. And that's with girls – that's not, I mean, how they are attacked on social media, how they're judged, how they're, um, and this isn't me being on a feminist, like, soapbox, but, like, how, how girls are objectified, mm-hmm. right, from men and boys. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a shame. And then now you throw the social media aspect, the 2010 to now, is now it's just this platform is exponentially greater Mm -hmm. that they just get attacked and i can't even imagine i can't even imagine at all like to be successful to be liked you've got to have a TikTok where you're dressing in scandalous clothes and dancing and that's how you get followers and those followers directly correlate to how important you are and That's just a scary, sad place that we're putting our girls. Yeah, it it makes it real when you think about your Mm 10-year-old. And the stat, 318 per 100,000 for 10 to 14 are hurting themselves. And that's 318 girls reported at least. My mind takes me back to the Drew Robinson episode, and, and I'm literally getting emotional just thinking about this. Because I think about how lonely, and I said this over and over, the thought that crushed me was how lonely he felt in that moment Mm -hmm. that he thought the best solution here is to end it all. And I think about these 318 girls or the 640 that are older or the 400 plus boys, Mm -hmm. the literal thousands of kids who are finding themselves in a place where my best option is to end it all. And how devastating that is as a parent 
to think about your child being that lonely. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think about just kind of where we're at, um, and even where you and I live, um, very affluent demographic people are doing well, but the problem that, that we're seeing is that parents, we are more selfish than we ever have been. We're worried about our job, our income, our social life, making parenting easy so it's not inconvenient for us mm. so that our life is better and we are devastating our kids. Yeah. Like the areas that we live, teen suicide is through the roof. Yes. And you would think, oh, this is, you live a great life. You live this bubble, this suburban, like, you know, median income of 150000 per household. Like, this is, like, great. Like, this is where you, people are coming in flocks from across the country to live here. Yet, the kids are struggling. They're struggling with drugs. They're struggling with depression, struggling with suicide. Because it's on us. It's on us parents. Because... It's not about raising our kids. It's not, we can't put aside our social life, our income, our job to fulfill our responsibility to raise our kids. And it's just, it's, man, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It really is heartbreaking. Yeah. So, what's driving the surge in mental illness and suicide? And I think an element that you just touched on, he doesn't touch on yet, but I think that's a huge point is the lack of relationship with your kid. And again, we don't want to paint a broad brush. Everybody's different. Yep. But that mentality is very, very enticing because I, I struggle with that all the time. Mm -hmm. I can stay here an extra hour and get my work in because it's important for me to advance in my career mm -hmm. or I can go home and spend that hour feeding to my boys. Yeah. What's the easier choice? Stay at work. Yeah. And I'm ashamed to say that a lot of times that work wins. Yep. And that's, that's an element that, that I think is a great point. But what he talks about, what's driving this uh, surge in mental illness and suicide. Twinge finds that there are just two activities that are significantly correlated with depression and other suicide-related outcomes, such as, su such as considering suicide, making a plan, or making an actual attempt. Electronic device, u device use, such as a smartphone, tablet, or computer, and watching TV. On the other hand, there are five activities that have inverse relationships with depression, meaning that kids who spend more hours per week on these activities show lower rates of depression. Sports and other forms of exercise, attending religious services, reading books and other print media, in-person social interactions, and doing homework. Part of what's going on may be that devices take us away from people. Human beings are an ultra-social ultra species. Humans are able to work together in large groups with a clear division of labor. Humans love teams, team sports, synchronized movements, and anything else that gives us the feeling of one for all and all for one. Of course, social media makes it easier than ever to create large groups, but those virtual groups are not the same as in-person connections. They do not satisfy the need for belonging in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think he absolutely nails it, that yes, we're more connected than ever, Yes, we can reach groups and be part of groups more than ever, mm -hmm. but those are virtual. We talk yeah. about it all the time. When we have a podcast guest in person versus when we have them on Zoom, it's just a different vibe. It's a different feel. There's a different connection mm -hmm. in the conversation. It's just a better conversation when it's in person. That's not by accident. Mm -mm. That's how we're wired. That's how we're made Yeah, is these in person. That's like we have a craving to be a part of groups. Yeah. And I just thought it was fascinating because these guys, to my knowledge, aren't religious individuals. Right. But it's interesting that sports and other forms of exercise, attending religious services, reading books and other. So the point there is having that group of people that you can look forward to seeing mm -hmm. that you're working towards something. Mm -hmm. And the more we do that virtually, the less we're doing that in person. Yeah. Yeah. A couple, a couple things, I think. Are important about this is we, we talked about in the in the wisdom series like the importance of reading books right you talk about relationship reading a book takes you to a place in connection with the author and the characters because you're inside that person's mind right it's totally different than scrolling through somebody's feed 
because when you're actually reading press, like printed press, like that just takes you to a different place. The other thing is the thing that's in common with all of those activities is in order to do those sports activities at religious facility, uh, reading homework. What was the fifth? Um, so oh, just interaction, personal yep. interaction, right? Is you have to be present in those, in those situations. You can't be scrolling through social media mm. while you're playing third base. Yeah. You can't be on social media when you are at your youth group, right? And you're there, like you, you put them away and you're entrenched in what you're doing there. When you're reading, you can't be reading and looking at Instagram or TikTok, right? When you are actually having a conversation with someone, I mean, some people do, but like really in order to have that interaction, you've got to connect. Like, and I think about this podcast and one of the things that I've tried to do as it's gone early on, you guys used to get on me all the time because I'd be on my phone. I'd be like looking at my email. I'd be doing other things and I'm trying to be focused about being present because and here, here's a question for all the listeners. How many times while listening to this podcast, have you opened up your social media or opened up your email while you're listening? You're kind of like over the, doing that as well. And you notice listening to podcasts, I'm not trying to downplay us listening to podcasts. Isn't on that. Isn't on that list. Like I, I look, please continue to listen. I'm not trying to kill us and, and kill what we're doing. I think it's really important, but the, the actual connection team sports connecting spiritually, connecting relationally, Connecting through a book, having that inter, uh, intellectual, uh, intellectual stimulation, like those things, you have to be present, and you're not going through this fantasy land of social media. And it's really important that that we are doing more of those activities. Yeah, that's a great point about podcasts. You won't find anybody that listens more than me. Yeah, and part of the draw for me and people, a lot of people, is. If two people are having a conversation on the podcast, yeah. I feel like I'm a part yeah, of that conversation. Yeah, and I would but, say you but, can... But to your point, that is not near as good. Even though I seek that dopamine and that, and that feels good to yeah. listen on their conversation, when I have a conversation with a person yeah. in person, mm -hmm. it's so much better. The discussion's way better. Mm -hmm. The feeling I get from it is way better. It's more life-giving. Yeah. As good as it is to listen to a podcast, to your point, podcasts are great. We're, we're, we're self-serving when we yeah. say podcasts are great. Yeah. Please keep listening. Yeah. But you're not going to be able to replicate that feeling you're yeah. after. Here's the, the only way to get that feeling you're after is human to human interaction. hundred percent. And one day, so I was a communications major and it's kind of a joke in like college athletics. Oh, were you a football player? Oh, you a comm major? Yeah, I was a, I was a comm major. I studied communication. <laughs> what is it, family studies or something? Yeah, That's another one. Sure. <laughs> Social at, at studies. Fresno, or... Fresno it was, uh, it was like criminal justice, communications, and African-American history. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are the three majors <laughs> you had to do. Uh, but it was, it's one of the things that it, it's funny in the 2000s, we talked a lot. And even like in the business sector, we talked a lot about nonverbal communication. We talked about, um, Oh gosh, now I'm drawing blanks on it. Interpersonal communication, all these different types of communication. Nobody talks about communication anymore, right? Because how do we communicate? We communicate through email, we communicate through social media and text. Yeah. yeah. Like Tiffany and I are weird because we would like texting, unless it's like a quick, hey, da, 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 like I would rather talk on the phone. Mm. And we're weird because of that. People like, like we'll literally cancel our calls, text back. What's up? Like, no, I, I need to talk to you. Like if we don't, if you don't want to talk, then I'm, that's it. But we don't talk about those forms of communication and we are unhealthier because we're not practicing and we're not learning about those types of communication. Mm -hmm. Like you learn so much more about a person when you can actually physically see them in the conversation, how they react, how, because then how do you, how do you implement Emotional intelligence, like, oh my gosh, he's not reacting well. I need to change how I'm talking to him, or I need to change the dialogue. I can sense that they're uncomfortable. I need to, I need to move a different direction because he's not getting the response that I'm looking for. Like all of these things that like really take part in communication, we're not talking about and we're not doing those things because our form of communication has changed over the last 10 years. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Next. Number three, changes in parenting practices. Here we go. Parents, 
calling us all out here. David, hey, you want to hand me that soapbox over there? I'm going to jump up on this here in a little bit. <laughs> when you combine the giant crime wave that began in the 1960s with the rapid spread of cable TV in the 1980s, including news channels that offered round-the-clock coverage of missing child cases, you can see why American parents grew fearful and defensive by the 1990s. The crime wave ended rather abruptly in the early 1990s when rates of nearly all crimes began to plummet all over the United States. Now, again, this was written before 2021, so crime rates are back up, but nevertheless. Nevertheless, the fear of crime did not diminish along with the crime rate, and the new habits of fearful parenting seem to have become new national norms. American parenting is now wildly out of sync with the actual risk that strangers pose to children. We believe that efforts to protect children from environmental hazards and vehicular accidents have been very good for children. But efforts to protect kids from risk by preventing them from gaining experience, such as walking to school, climbing a tree, or using sharp scissors, are different. Such, such protections come with costs, as kids miss out on opportunities to learn skills, independence, and risk assessment. By placing a protective shield over our children, we inadvertently stunt their growth and deprive them of the experiences they need to become successful and functional adults. Parents spending time with their kids is generally a good thing, but too much close supervision and protection can morph into safetyism. Safetyism takes children who are anti-fragile by nature and turns them into young adults who are more fragile and more anxious than their, and therefore more receptive to the untruth of fragility. What doesn't kill, kill you makes you weaker. So <laughs> it's funny. And, th and this is not, this is not something to joke about because, um, we have, we have a handful of friends that have, have lost children to drowning. Um, and it's, and it's a real thing, but, uh, so we, we just got a pool at the house, uh, finished it a few months back and, you know, we, we did it so that we could have community and have interactions with people. We want people to come over all the time. Like that's what we, that's what we did. We want to have fellowship with people. Um, but we had some friends over, uh, on Monday, Memorial Day. Yeah. Yeah. And Last Monday. I, I think y'all were, I, I don't know if y'all were still there. Yeah. We were there when the little boy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. In. So, so when we grew up, how did kids learn how to swim? Throw them in the deep end. Throw them in the deep end. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, figure it out. Right. And so it was, it's one of those things now, like not allowed at the house. If your kid isn't like a, pro, uh, you know, a proficient swimmer, they've got to have the floaties on and I get it. And it's all about being safe because we wore floaties as a kid too. But, but if we don't let our kids actually test the water, literally and metaphorically, how do you know what they can do? So this little boy, he's four, doesn't know how to swim. And my daughter's partly, to, partly at fault. She talked him into taking his floaty off. <laughs> she says, no, 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 you should take it off. She was just trying <laughs> to, to oh, protect man, him from This is my five-year-old. Hey, y'all watch out. If y'all live in Dallas, <laughs> this Sienna's coming for you. I guarantee it. <laughs> um, but uh, she... He takes it off and he jumps into the pool. And it was funny because the parents like look at each other and like, oh, Hunter's, oh yeah, he's, he's in the pool. So, wait, he can't swim. <laughs> and so like jumped in. But the thing was, is he who, the little boy who doesn't know how to swim, was able to tread water, never dipped under the water. And he, he yeah, did, we need, dad jumped in. He was super reactive, jumped in, pulled him out. But it was one of those like, wow, like we don't give our kids enough credit on how resilient they are. Mm -hmm. Like it, it really is, it's really stunting our kids growth because we don't ever give them the chance to fail. Right. Yeah. And it's one thing to protect your kid from drowning. Yes. Or protect and again, your kid I, I'm not from, saying, yeah, hey, no, I, just throw your kids yeah, in the pool. That's right. not what I'm saying. Point well taken. And, and, and make sure your kids are buckled up. Like yeah. that, those are safety yeah. measures that are necessary. Yeah. But it's, when it turns into, as he phrases it, safetyism, yep. where everything now, you take that seatbelt mentality mm -hmm. to when they have an argument with their friend. And I'm going to protect my kid from this argument and from the pain it's going to cause from this argument. That's when it becomes a problem. Yep. Because now you're protecting them from life experience. Yep. You're not protecting them from drowning yeah. or from a car wreck that could be devastating. You're not protecting them from the fear or yeah. the hurt of a disagreement. Mm -hmm. And... The more parents do that, the more we raise a generation of kids who now are afraid of disagreement. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing now. Yeah. We're seeing people who get feelings hurt by words, people who can't handle disagreement. 
who can't handle the discomfort from disagreement. That's when the shift is yep. an issue. Yep. And that's what we've seen. And even things like when I was a kid, we used to walk to school every day. Yeah. Now my wife's like hesitant to let my son ride the bus to school yeah. because he's going to be by himself. <laughs> but what, and, and what are we doing? We're invoking, like they are now receiving our fear and then they themselves become fearful. Right. Yeah. So now they are not even trying to yeah, do Even things. the words you use, hey, hey, be careful, don't jump off that. Yeah. Even that can start to bleed into yeah. them not taking as many risks. Yeah. Now, again, safety is one thing. Yeah. But avoiding, and, and as we said in a couple of, uh, maybe this last week or the week before, it's paving the road for the child as yeah. opposed to preparing the child for the road. Yep. It's constant pavement, constant mowing things down, constant mm -hmm. taking away all barriers. And yes, that's great short term when they're five, but what kind of ramifications that having when they're 18 and they're looking for their first job? That's right. Or they're trying to pick what school they're going to go spend the next four years. What happens when they go to college <laughs> and you've done everything for them the last 18 years of their life yeah. and they are clueless? Yeah. You see some issues there pop up. So that's number three. Number four, and the last two we're going to talk about today, number four, the decline of free play. This one was interesting because we've talked about free play and letting your kids outside and getting back to basics and, and things like that. But here's the science behind it. It says play is essential for wiring a mammal's brain to create a function, a functioning adult. Mammals that are deprived of play won't develop to their full capacity. Evidence for the benefits of play is now strong, and there's a growing body of scholarship linking play deprivation to later anxiety and depression. Given this research and given the rising levels of adolescent anxiety and depression and suicide, our educational system and parenting practices should offer kids more time for free play. But in fact, the opposite has happened. Peter Gray, a leading researcher of play, defines free play as activity that is freely chosen and directed by the participants and undertaken for its own sake, not consciously pursued to achieve ends that are distinct from activity itself. Piano lessons and soccer practice are not free play, but goofing around on a piano or organizing a pickup soccer game are. Vigorous physical free play outdoors and with other kids is a crucial kind of play, one that our evolved minds are expecting. Compared with previous generations, members of iGen have therefore had less time, have had much less of the kind of unsupervised free play that Gray says is most valuable. They have been systematically deprived of opportunities to dose themselves with risk. Instead of enjoying a healthy amount of risk, this generation is more likely than earlier ones to avoid it. If members of iGen have been risk deprived and are therefore risk, more risk averse, then it is likely they will have lower bar for what they see as daunting or threatening. They will see more extraordinary life tasks as beyond their ability to handle on their own without help from an adult. It should not surprise us that anxiety and depression rates began rising rapidly on campus as soon as iGen arrived. I want to read that last part again. If members of iGen have been, have been risk deprived and are therefore more risk averse, then it is likely that they have a lower bar for what they see as daunting or threatening. Mm -hmm. I thought that was such a key yeah. sense in that. We've lowered the bar so much for what is threatening to us. Mm -hmm that now words are threatening. Yeah, words are threatening. ideas are threatening. I have PTSD. Like, you're putting yourself in the same category as a Vietnam vet or an Iraq vet or an Afghan, uh, uh, you know, a vet of Af Afghanistan. You are saying, oh, I have PTSD because someone talked to me mean. Or I have PTSD because somebody verbally abused me. Look, I'm not condoning verbal abuse, but our bar is set so low on what trauma is mm -hmm. and what and what violence is because again we are not we are not exposing letting them and not even necessarily exposing them letting them expose themselves mm -hmm. to some of these yeah. some of these challenges right right yeah it's just yeah, the decline of free. Who knew that letting yeah. kids out to play by themselves was going to have such a detrimental effect? Yeah. Because, again, that's, we're so anxious to even let our kids play out in the front yard by themselves. Yeah. Because we played it up in their head that worst-case scenario is going to happen. Yep. When, statistically speaking, it's actually less likely now than it was in the 90s, statistically Crazy. speaking. Crazy. But the fear hasn't gone away. Yeah. It's going to 
I guess, I guess you just got to do it and overcome that fear as a parent. Yeah. And that, now, the problem is there's just been enough. It, there's enough cases to draw on. Yeah. And that can, you can really bleed that over into a lot of things. I avoid jumping off of cliffs into a lake because I heard of one guy that did it and he landed funny. Why would you ever not do that? That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I avoid it. I, I, I'm, I'm just using this example. I actually yeah. love jumping off cliffs. Yeah. But yeah. one would avoid it because yeah. they heard of some guy who landed yeah. funny and ingested water and drowned. Yeah. Statistically speaking, you're going to be fine yeah. jumping off that cliff. Yeah. But just think about all the different elements. Yeah. You experienced a, a hurtful, you know, joke when you were in third grade from a certain member of a certain group. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, I live the rest of my life demonizing that certain group because of that one joke in third grade. Mm -hmm. You can see how it can bleed into every aspect yeah. of our community and our life when we take this safety mentality. And the last thing we're going to talk about, and again, if this had been written in 2022 as opposed to 2019, I think the title of this section would have been COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the growth. That he calls it the growth of campus bureaucracy. But I thought this was interesting from a, poli from a political standpoint. It says, overreaction and overregulation are usually the work of people within bureaucratic structures who have developed a mindset commonly known as CYA, cover your ass. They know that they can... They know, they know they can be held responsible for any problem that arises on their watch, especially if they took no action to prevent it. So they often adopt a defensive stance. In their minds, overreacting is better than underreacting, overregulating is better than underregulating, and caution is better than courage. Mm -hmm. This attitude reinforces the safety as a mindset that many students learn in childhood. So that's from a political standpoint. I want to touch on that in a second, but here's more on the campus. It says, some professors end up concluding that it isn't worth the risk of having to appear before a bureaucratic panel, so it's better to just eliminate any material from the syllabus or lecture that could lead to a complaint. Then, as more and more professors shy away from potentially provocative materials and discussion topics, their students miss out on opportunities to develop intellectual anti-fragility. As a result, they may come to find even more material offensive and require even more protection. Yep. And he talks a lot about this in the book and talk about like universities and where we're at. Now, these are professors. So this is, this is where they spend a lot of their time. So a lot of this book is relating to that college, the, the college uh, environment. But uh, one of the articles that he referenced, uh, a professor um, who is a Hispanic lesbian says I my job is not to tell you what to think it's how to think and we're losing that ability to teach these students how to think just because I'm saying something that you disagree with doesn't mean that it's hate just because I'm I'm teaching something that is not hateful but because they aligned with a certain group 500 years ago they were identified as that I can't teach it because they were racist mm -hmm. because they had slaves back then. So now we can't teach this. What we're doing is we're coddling these minds. And so now people are like over the top. You can't say this, you can't say that. And this goes political. Like you can't say anything. And so people are just like, um, it's going to be easier. Just not, I just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Like it's, it's not worth it. I'm just going to be quiet and I'm just going to keep my job and it's just easier. But what we're doing is we're now, we're now like taking away the opportunity for our, our college students, the next generation of, of workforce away from actually figuring out how to critically think because everything that is taught is what the students want. It's like literally a child, as a parent, the child comes in and says, what do you want for dinner? Um, I want to have Cheetos, um, and I want to have ice cream. And I it's like a five-year-old picking every single one of its meals. That's what we're doing with college students now. Right. No, 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 That makes me uncomfortable. I, that's, that's caused trauma because my great-grandfather's cousin's Dennis dog walker he was attacked by those kinds of people. So you now are not allowed to teach that to anybody because it affects me. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing on campus now. Yeah. 
And so now our college students are like, you wonder why there's this one train of thought coming out of universities because everything has been stripped that actually challenges their beliefs. And it's honestly, it is, that is where I see the direction of the, of the country going so rapidly and it's scary. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't remember if it, we already talked about it or if we're going to talk about it, but he talks about, statistically speaking, the professors on campus, seven, it's seven to one left-leaning versus oh, right-leaning. Yeah. And their point in bringing that up, it's not that it's bad that it's left-leaning. Mm -hmm. It's Their argument is it's bad that only one side of the aisle is ever being talked about. Yeah. So even if it was reverse, it would still be an issue. Yeah. If it was seven to one right leaning versus left leaning. Mm -hmm. So it's not the problem that it's, it's not the problem that left leaning ideals are being taught. It's that's the only thing being taught. Yeah. And we, think about how that bleeds to our normal everyday conversations. Yeah. We self-regulate. Oh, you can't say that. Yeah. Oh, you can't talk about it. So now we're self-censoring yeah. because we don't. And now again, I, I, there is an element of being mindful of people's feelings. I, I, yeah, I'm not saying that. 100%. But now we're avoiding big swaths of discussions that we think could be valuable mm -hmm. because it's just much easier to avoid it and not, and not deal with the headache. That's right. And so real world problems are not being solved because it's much easier to avoid it. I think of the COVID response. The easy response is lock everybody in their homes yeah. and, le and, let's, and let's just let this thing, ride this thing out. Yeah. Whereas a more balanced approach of understanding the nuances of who's vulnerable, Who's more susceptible? How can we still keep things going while protecting the the you know the elderly, whatever the circumstance? No, let's just nobody's gonna fire yeah. me yeah. for locking people down. Yeah. But That's they right. are gonna fire me if I don't and everybody dies. Yeah. So that was a big response in our government was cover your ass, is yeah. how he yeah. said it. Yeah. What what's how what's the path of least resistance here? Instead of having good well, common discussion, well, and we see this, it. we see this in cancel culture too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, think about, think about, and I'm not saying this whole Johnny Depp deal, like, and I'm not, I'm not taking a side on that. I mean, it's just a circus in general. But think about all of the, all of the sponsors or all of the groups that he worked with. It's all cover your ass. Like, oh, mm -hmm. there's potentially something provocative. We don't know anything about it. We don't know any of the any of the uh, evidence. We don't know what's going on. But we're just going to fire him from everything. We're going to cut him off altogether mm -hmm. because it's it's cover your ass. Like it's it's not about again. This cancel culture is if you believe something different than what I think, then you are canceled. Mm -hmm. Whether you're right, wrong, malicious helpful, whatever it is, if you believe something different, you're going to be canceled. And anybody associated with that person, once they have become canceled, it's, yeah, we got to cut you too, because it's not worth losing revenue over that. Even though it's wrong to cut you off and, you know, to, to fire you, because we really don't think that you did anything wrong, but everybody else said it is, it's just easier to yeah. see you. And that's what's sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of easy, these last three episodes, including today, have been very easy because it's easy to sit around yeah. the microphone yeah. and bitch and moan about all the problems that we have. And it's important, right? You need to point things out. You need to understand what, what led to where we are, which is what today's episode was all about. Why are we here? Because when you can, when you can understand why, you can understand how to attack it and how to course correct. Yep. So it's been very easy the last few yep. weeks to sit here and cry and whine and, and hopefully it hasn't come off that way. Hopefully these have been positive or helpful, productive discussions. Yeah. You're more but helpful. My, I'm more bitchy. <laughs> my point is next week, I'm super excited about next week. Cause now we get to actually do the hard work yeah. of fixing things yeah. and really thinking critically and really getting to the nuance and really understanding, okay, we've laid out the problems. I think everybody's well aware of the problems at this yeah. point. Now, what do we do about it? That's right. Just like our episode yesterday, it's such a huge amount. I don't know how to start my fitness journey. Same thing here. Society is such a massive problem. Where do we even begin? Yeah. And I'm, that's why I'm excited about next week is that it's going to allow us to dive into some real actual things Tangible that we can do acts, as parents, yeah. things we can do as professors, things we can do as politicians, things that actually, um, that actually head us into the right direction. Yeah. So to close us out from the book, it says, this concludes part three of this book. In these chapters, we showed how the new culture of safetyism what we described in part one and the dramatic events that we described in part two are the result of many intersecting trends 
and explanatory threads that all come together in recent years. These threads reach back into history, down into childhood, and out into national politics. Having offered this explanation of how we got here, now we turn to the question of where we go next. Boom. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you join us next week for the actual good stuff of how we fix these issues. Um, please help us out by sharing these episodes. If you got something out of today, if you got something out of yesterday, if you get something out of any of these episodes, the best way you can help us out is by texting to a friend, posting on your Instagram, your social media. Spread the word. Help us spread the word. Mm -hmm. We're trying to reach more people. We're trying to turn the tide so that we're not a, a, a society of bitchers and bitches and moaners. <laughs> bitchers and moaners? Is that a word? It works. However it, it works. is. We're a society of those that take action yeah. and actually solve problems yeah. and want to make things better as opposed to just continuing to complain about how things That's are right. terrible. Yeah. So. Have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend. We will catch you. We've got a great, exciting episode coming up next week. Yeah. It's not many times that I feel intimidated in life. Usually I'm, uh, without sounding like a douche, I'm usually the bigger person walking into a room today. Well, you're next be, week's episode. You'll still be bigger, but. I'll still be bigger than this still person. Still be bigger, but. But this person can literally kill me with yeah, his own bare hands. It's true. So look out for that episode coming on Monday. Super excited to have that for you guys. Um, and then we'll talk to you next week. Have a great weekend. All right.